I posted a video recently on mastering in Studio One with the project page, and uh, there are some questions, and I'm going to do this video as a follow-up to some of those questions and help explain things a little bit further. Go check this out. If you've never used the project page, it's a really handy feature in Studio One. One of my favorite things from back when I switched to Studio One, back when it was on version two, I believe, the project page was a big reason why I switched. There were a lot of reasons, but that was one of them. That was long before I ever did any work with Persona. Look at Gregory, he's so cute. Um, so the comments here, uh, there was one, by the way, <laughs> this one made me laugh. How come you do a, pay a video on the project page every year? Because it changes, because we're a software company and we update things, uh, and also because there's someone who's just discovering Studio One today, and they need to know about the project page. It's incredible. Um, and there's a chance they may not see that video I made four years ago on how the project page works. And it's good to it's good to relearn things. So there's your answer there. But there was the one main question. Actually, there was a comment I want to address. And then there was a question or two questions I want to answer. Let me find the comment because this is really this is really fun and educational. Because mastering in a, just in in and of itself can be pretty complicated. Um, it's a lot more technical than, let's say, mixing or recording in some ways. So here's a question from Early Daniels. It says, Studio One, the project page are amazing. Thanks. I didn't make it, but thanks. Uh, however, the true peak lim metering is not accurate and needs fixing. Okay. When I use a high end true peak limiter and metering plugin and set the true peak to minus 0.1 decibels on my limiter, Studio One indicates clipping on its true peak metering. This is incorrect and can be misleading. Here's Fun fact, a limiter has a ceiling, but some of the sound still gets through. And a lot of times it's due to, and I don't have a super great understanding of this, but it's called intersample peaking. So you're, the, the signal's coming through one sample at a time, right? So at 44.1, it's a sample every one four, 44 thousandth of a second comes through. But the system, as far as I understand it, is interpolating what's happening between those samples. And sometimes that intersample area, what it's interpreting is happening, especially if it's a loud signal, can come through and actually come through the limiter as a clipping or as something that goes higher than the ceiling. Which is why when you set your ceiling this high, which is zero is clipping, so minus 0 0.1 is just barely below clipping, you're not giving yourself any, any headroom here, which is why mastering engineers such as uh, my buddy Ian Shepard and myself recommend setting your ceiling to minus one, which gives you a full dB of kind of headroom above the limiter because of that intersample peaking. Depending on how hard you're pushing the limiter, depending on the limiter itself, you may get, when I set mine to minus one and I cook the master pretty hard and it's pretty loud, um, a lot of times there are some peaks that get through that come out on the other side over minus one. So I might have my true peak measurement might be minus 0 0.6, but I set my ceiling at minus one. That's because of that inner sample peaking. So the real thing is just set your ceiling to minus one and you won't have this problem anymore and you're good to go. Common misconception that the ceiling, I thought this for a long time, that the ceiling is like a Gandalf, you shall not pass. And it mostly is. Sonically, that's what's happening. But technically, those sneaky little samples will get through and even pass the limiter, even though you were very, even though you specifically asked them not to. Who gets that reference? All right, so that was one thing I want to talk about. The main question was from, and by the way, y'all are generally speaking pretty nice in the comments, and I appreciate it. Um... This we'll get to, I think, in a minute. Here it is. Uh, Tavares Project said, great video. Can you spend some time on a video on this page in relation to the levels and balancing between song to song? Which meter do you use and how do you go about making the adjustments? Please and thank you. <laughs> how polite you are. Yes, let's talk about that in this video. So here is the project that I set up in that last video. And it's just a little two-song project. But as we can see, there are two pretty big just visually we can see there's a big volume difference between these two we're going to want to figure out a way to match them up and one of the ways of course and I'm just going to have the volume down so I can talk over this if we just go in and if we do like a loudness measurement on each of these then we can see that like this one's at minus 20 luffs got about 4 dB of headroom this one I believe is already mastered so it's a not a great example, but let's say we're trying to do a new compilation thing. You can see here, look, true peaking over one. I bet you I set that ceiling incorrectly. Um, when I mastered this, this was like seven years ago. I just grabbed it out of a folder. But anyway, 
Not great there. That's an example of what I was talking about. There's no way I set my limiter to over zero, but it still went through. This is not a Studio One issue. This is a me issue. <laughs> Bad me. Okay. So when we when we hit play on these, we can see on the meters, and for mastering, I like to use K14. We can see that this one's coming in pretty quiet. This one's coming in pretty loud. And the question is, how do we, first of all, kind of the bigger question is, how do we adjust the levels? Just Let's start there. And then the question of how do we kind of match the level so that it feels like a good volume from one to the next. Let's start with there are th three main ways that you can adjust the levels of things inside of the project page. The first, we'll kind of start in order of like the signal flow. The first is on the actual audio file itself. So this one, I could literally just grab that thing right there and just adjust it up and down. Problem with that right there is I'm probably clipping. So it's probably not helping things too much. But you could, for example, use normalization, option N, which is, uh, I believe, alt N on the PC. And that will normalize this audio to where it's exactly at zero. So it's as loud as it can go without clipping. Or you can also just uh, use this to just bump it up a little bit. Same thing here. I can bump it up or down using this. Also, clip gain envelopes. If you didn't know this, if you haven't used the project page in a couple of years, clip gain envelopes are now a part of it. So you could do that same thing increase and decrease using clip gain envelopes, which you can also automate, which make, I'm not going to mess things up. Let's leave that alone. Uh, but that exists as well. I like to use, if I'm in this situation, I only use the clip gain envelopes for something that's a little more automatable. But that's actually not what I use here. I usually leave these alone. I don't do any normalizing. I don't do any adjusting of these handles here because I like to do it up here. And the place that I like to do it is in the plugin section. I like to use a little friend I like to call mix tool. And mix tool, I'll put one of these, whoops, I'll put one of these on every track in the session, so every song, and then I will adjust the volume of each of these accordingly. So my mastering session will look something like this. I'll have a limiter on my master section. As you can see, my default limiter setting is to minus one ceiling. Gain can be, sometimes I go ahead and give it six because I know I'm going to need at least that, but let's just set it to zero for now. So a ceiling and threshold of minus one. And then I adjust the volume of each song to push into the correct volume it needs to be at the limiter. What's fun about this is you can almost do this without even listening. So I'll, I'll sometimes do this, this phase like while watching a YouTube video on the side because I can just look at the meters and see what's happening. So in this first song, I can just see in this loudest section here. Um, actually, let's set this back to what was it? I think it's normalized. Let's unnormalize it. There we go. Now it's nice and quiet. I can just look and see, all right, this one's coming in a little bit quiet. This is the louder section of the song. I want this to be up in the red a little bit. So I'll just adjust the level here. And we can just see what it's doing. I can say, all right, that feels pretty good. And move on to the next song. The next song is probably coming in nice and hot. That feels like about the right volume, so I may just leave it as it is. I could turn it up. I could turn it down. But this mix tool is like the first plug-in in my chain, and I go through for every song in the album and adjust this mix tool volume. The third place you can adjust volume is, you may not have noticed this. I honestly missed this for an embarrassingly long number of years before I realized it was there. But each of these tracks has a fader as well, just like in a session. So I can adjust the volume by bringing, well, if we come back to this first song, I can adjust the volume by moving this fader up and down, which is pretty handy. So the thing about this, and I don't actually almost never use this, is this is coming at the end of the chain, um, and I prefer to kind of get the level set at the beginning of the chain so that it's going to hit on my plugins. Where I've just this is the this is the way I've mastered for years and years. This is great for like a final adjustment at the end. It's nice if you've got everything almost right where you want it and you think, oh, this one just needs to come down a little bit. You can do this and it won't mess up any settings that you have. It won't lower the level going into a compressor, for example. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be coming at the end of the chain, just like it does in the mixer window. The fader is after all of the plugins. And that can be nice for a final kind of volume adjustment. But typically... I can think of probably, I'd say 95% of my mastering sessions, I never even touch this. I do all my level setting here, and then my plugins come after that. So now everything I put a plugin on is coming through that plugin at roughly the same level. So I'm getting some consistency across the board, which is helpful. So now, as far as the question of how do we set the levels, I'll do it mostly ballpark based on this K system meter. So K12 is what I like. I like the idea of the song needs to cross over this zero mark here. So where it goes from green to yellow right here, 
That's where I don't want anything to be much quieter than that. And then when it gets to the loudest sections of the song, I want it up here in the red, and it kind of hangs in the yellow for most of the song. Here in the quieter sections, for example, I would say that's probably that's probably getting a little too quiet, so I'm probably going to want to bump this volume up so that it's closer to that zero mark on the quiet parts. That's just an experience that's that's shown. The reason this metering is so interesting is because it if you have it like that, you have a good amount of dynamics to it. You're not going exceptionally loud, but you're also not leaving so much width of dynamic that it's you, you're in the car and you have to turn the quiet parts up to hear them and turn the loud parts down. It's kind of just a, an easy red light, green light, yellow light situation for setting levels. And I'll do, like I said, a lot of this I'll do just manually um, just by coming in and looking at what's happening on the meters. Another thing you can do is you have this Luffs meter over here on the far right hand side. And this is showing us the kind of the instantaneous current level of the loudness units or the Luffs value of this song. And so a friend of mine, good rule of thumb is like, let's make the loudest parts of the song hit around minus 10 perhaps. And then that should probably mean the overall loudness is going to be in the minus 12 to minus 14 range. Something that's nice and has a nice amount of dynamic to it. Um, then you can go and look and say, okay, this song in its loudest section is hitting at right around minus 9, minus 10. This one is hitting at actually around minus 11. So this one actually, ironically, might be quieter than this one. So we may look at that and say, well, let's bump this one up a decibel just to get it where it's peaking more around minus 10, and that might be good. But honestly, I don't do that for setting these types of levels. I just use, you're not going to believe this, I use my ears. I'll get the overall level, big picture, the whole kind of album at the level that I want for like the loudest parts are hitting about minus 10, maybe minus 9, maybe minus 8 if I'm feeling crazy. Um, but then I adjust between songs just by ear, just like I do with everything else in the music production process. And the thing I listen to usually is the vocal. So how does the vocal match from one song to the next? That's the primary thing I look at. And then if that's not working, I'll just I'll just listen to the end of one song and then imagine where the next song begins and the volume I'm expecting to hear. And if it doesn't hit that, I make some adjustment. I either turn the first one up or down or the second one up or down based on what makes sense. But typically if I've set the levels where I want them, I'm turning some things down to make it work better for the album. I'm not necessarily turning other things up because going up would mean pushing it harder into the limiter, which would cause more problems than it's probably worth. Now there was one question about fades. Uh, clean intro, song ends and fades. The I don't have, honestly, there's not much here to say other than check the beginnings and the ends of your songs. And a lot of times if a song, if I didn't create a fade in the mix, which a lot of times I don't, then a lot of times I'll use the built-in fade here in the project page to give me that exact fade out that I want. I'm not a big fan of fading out over a long period, but you could do that and have a little more control here versus doing it with a fader automation move in the mix. So sometimes I'll save that for mastering, but I try to clean up the beginnings and the ends during the mix session so that I can just master it and just do a quick fade at the end if it needs it. So for example, this song, if I turn it back up, it has a a little intro part. At the end of the world. So that intro part, I kind of liked it. I thought it was cool because it kind of like, it's almost like an orchestra warming up and then it begins. But I actually sent this off to a mastering engineer friend and he actually cut out the beginning entirely. Um, and you can do that by either bringing this up or if you hold down, I always forget the modifier. There's some modifier to match, or I guess just slide it back. And he had it set like this. At the end. Or even close or something like this. So it just started right with the song. At the end of the world. And that's fine too. And if you do that, you have to come kind of check the end. Okay, did this one, they all kind of need to move and slide back. Oh, I honestly, I have, I'll be honest. This, this is, someone's going to leave a comment and be like, well, Joe you shouldn't be making videos. You don't know how it works very true. There are times I don't know how some things work because no one knows how everything works. Um, but the between song thing, it's a combination. I always forget. There's a combination of moving with and without holding down a, a modifier key. So if I just drag the audio, it just moves like this. If I want to give it more space before it begins, like a little bit more of a gap, 
I think I press Command on the Mac, Control on the PC, and that moves this without moving the audio. And then if I hold down Option, that kind of moves that gap relative to one another. And then you can also control the amount of gap up here. There is a... Here, click this button. Sorry, this is one thing that's hard to find if you don't know it's there. This little button here gives you like a normal view versus a small view, which gives you a few more things that you can control. One of those is this number, oh goodness, this number here. And that number is the gap that happens before the song. So I could set this to exactly five seconds if I want. Two seconds is the default, I believe. Um, so that's, as you can see, as I move this, as I'm moving this, this number over here is changing. So that's another way that you can change that. So that you can, if, if you're ever in doubt with this, just hold a modifier, command, control, alt, um, option, and just see what it does. Like right now I'm holding option, it moves without moving that. So I can maybe have it, this song start here, but it actually kicks off on the CD, for example, there. All right, that's enough of me. I, I regret this last section because here come the comments saying, Joe has no business making videos because he does not know how everything works. And I will just say, agree to disagree. That's fair. By the way, if you live in the Middle Tennessee area, as I'm shooting this video, the 17-year cicadas are here. Take a listen. I don't know how well you heard them, but they are very loud. So my batch of videos this month is going to be covered with cicadas. So that's my gift to you. All right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for your comments. See you in the next one.